warn you out. You need to check out my next guest. She's a leadership expert, keynote speaker, best-selling author, Swan Germer. On exercise, the best-selling Oprah featured author of seven books, four-time Pulitzer nominated journalist, and has gone directly to more than 300 famous leaders for their insight and wisdom. And she shows how to take risks and push your limits beyond anything you ever imagined. What a thrill and honor it is to have Swan Germer on the show. Swan, welcome to the Dose of Leadership podcast. Well, that's my pleasure. It's good to talk to you, Richard. You know, I love your stuff, and we were talking a little bit before the, the interview, and I love, what I really love about you is you talk about authenticity, you talk about being courageous, you talk about taking off masks. Before we dive into those topics, tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got so passionate about talking about leadership and, and crushing people's limiting beliefs. Well, you know, I've got this kind of classic story. I had a good career going as a journalist, and then one day I got a new boss hole. And he just made up his mind that he was going to get in my way and really thwart my progress. He wasn't a good guy. And it's interesting, he did the same thing to another reporter in the room who then went on, left, went to the Los Angeles Times, won a Pulitzer, wrote two number one New York Times best-selling books, and then had two movies made from his work. Sometimes you get somebody who stands in your way. And that's what led me ultimately to leave that job in Denver as a reporter, go into management at a newspaper in Tampa, and then absolutely flounder. Because I used the talents that had always worked for me, you know, very hard-charging, aggressive reporter, no BS, impatient, get it done now, black and white thinking. And then I went into management where I was supposed to know how to win friends and influence people, and I was completely ineffective and in fact people were quitting so I had to figure out what I needed to do in order to be effective particularly as a strong woman in a male dominated environment and I went looking for a book giving me insights on what to do and there wasn't anything and I ended up going to great leaders and asking them what they learned the hard way so I had the questions because I had the problems and wrote about it that book Hard One Wisdom was my first book. It is a legendary obstacle course that <laughs> gave me a real run for my money. It was. Uh, it looked like my dream was never going to happen, and I stuck with it. And my friends turned it into a bestseller, and I kept writing letters to Oprah's people, and something worked. It was a very difficult time to be out promoting it because it was right after 9-11. And I just yeah. persevered. And perseverance is probably the greatest trait in leadership we can have. Yeah, I love that story. Now, let's, let's go a little more de details about that story. Because I think it's a great example of tenacity and perseverance. You're, you're absolutely right. You were saying that you came out with this book. This was your first book, correct? Right. Everyone with them? Right. Here you are, and it's getting released on September 9th. Is that what you said? Is that no, what no, I came out September the 10th. Yeah, I signed my first. Yeah, I signed the first copy of the book on September 11th, which was for my parents, right oh. as everything was was going crazy. So. Man, so how long did it take you to get to get in the it in front of Oprah? Because it, would that really be the spark that kind of changed everything once you got in front of Oprah's eyes? Well, you know, you have a book come out, you really have three months to make it. So that was about the window there. I did what most people did at that point was my, my tour got canceled and I was giving up and I always say it's easier to blame your book's failure on Osama bin Laden than the fact that your book might not have been good but at some point I had to get it together rally figure out how to get my book out there so I just started traveling the country and staying with friends and really getting out there to push it and writing all these letters to Oprah's people and something broke through. And I always say that's a really great example about how the window is open to succeed when others are giving up because my second book I thought was was better and it didn't make it to Oprah. Should have, but it didn't. And you know, the window was there at 9/11 when everyone else had quit. So, you never know. You never know. And, you know, also when I was moving recently, I found the the file with all those rejection letters in it. And I don't know what kept me going. I had quit, I'd quit my job to write the book. I would left journalism, which I had done journalism since I was 15 years old. And it 
it just appeared that it was never going to happen. The, the letters in that file, they all were saying, not us, not now, not right. And there was a stop sign on every single corner. And I just kept moving forward. Sometimes it's hard to see that you just don't know how close you are to turning the corner until you turn the corner. So you just keep moving forward a little bit at a time. And that's what, what I did. Think? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, what do you think it was that helped you um, internally? Had you had you always been tenacious? And I mean, or what was it at that moment that kept you going forward? Because I know it's a struggle for all of us. I know in myself too. You know, every time you, you hear those no's and no's and no's and no's, it's so easy to give up. What prevented you from giving up? Well, Richard, that's a good question. And you know, to be honest, I have always been tenacious because I was a reporter, but I wasn't always tenacious as an individual, and that was a great lesson for me. Was that I had to believe in myself, even when I was losing confidence. Because if you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to believe in you. And I had to make up my mind I wanted to win. Now, what kept me in the game was I was starving. I was starving. I had quit my job to do this. I thought that I would get this bestseller out in nine months or a year and start rolling in the cash. And three years had gone by. And I had to make it a success. So... You just keep in there with that vision that you're going to do it no matter what, and something will work out. Yeah, really, you know, and I'm curious of what your thought is on this. And you, you obviously, you, you've interviewed over 50 um, very powerful and successful women in that book. Um, a couple questions. The first one is, well, let me go back. When I did, when doing this podcast, the biggest thing I learned is that, and it's been inspiring to me, and it's been helpful and therapeutic to me, that when all these people that I've interviewed, I realize that they're no different than me. And yeah, they may have a lot of money, they may have a lot of what I consider success, or I put them in a success bucket. But what's been inspiring to me is they have the same limiting beliefs, even now, even though they've been tremendously successful. Did you find that too when you interviewed these, all these women? Isn't that the most validating eye-opener? that you can look at people that we really put up on pedestals, that we admire and we, we believe in, and find out that they're being just as mean to themselves as we are to ourselves. For me, that discovery, which was almost university, universal through all my books, the discovery that self-esteem issues are rampant, liberated me from my self-esteem issue. Because it's not real. You can look at the best put together person in a room and that person likely has said some really negative things that have, you know, even though they may be successful, imagine how successful they would be if they weren't saying that. And, right. you know, you alluded to something else which I really believe, and that is there is no special success DNA. There isn't. You have the same ability to achieve and be excellent as the next person. You know, granted, some people maybe are working with few less brain cells or may not have been blessed with, with some of the, the biochemical things that give us an edge. But for the most part, if you're above average, you can do excellent things. You just have to figure out how you're going to learn it, what you're going to do, how you strategize your career. You've certainly seen people who have operated on a huge platform who aren't as smart as you would think. And it's that they had courage. I think courage is the one thing that really delineates the difference between the meek and the mighty. That they are able to take risks and bet on themselves and move forward. And if others can do that, why not you? Absolutely. Oh, I love that. You know, and I, I agree. I can't agree with you more. You know, and I used to think for the longest time that uh, courage was, you know, not being afraid. I didn't think I could be courageous until I really started understanding that you, you're going to be afraid. The uncertainty, you're going to, there's nothing you can do about the uncertainty. There's nothing you can do about the fear. You will be afraid. And once I realized that, that was kind of liberating for me, is that it is a choice. It is an absolute choice. You can't plan to be courageous, but you can certainly choose to, to be it, I guess is my point. Right, and I think the more you do it, you can take conscious power over your fear. I do a lot of work on this with companies because fear cripples us in not just our career decisions, but in absolute performance because we don't want to make mistakes, and it's okay to make mistakes. Mistakes will not kill you. The thing that kills you in this day and age, because things move so fast, is the inability to make a decision. You have to be able to twist and pivot and be fast enough to recalibrate and then 
change things, change it up. So yeah. that you know, that's the the one thing on that. But in terms of fear, I've gotten pretty fearless because there's only one thing that I really fear in life, and that is dying like my mom did, which is over 20 years of suffering. So once, I mean, what is there to fear really other than that? Nothing. Because right. everything you do, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to kill you. And so, you know, when I turned 50, I, I always laugh because I got myself a group on. And I went skydiving with this company outside of Tampa. And, and the guy, you know, he was very nice. He says, before we go, I'm going to give you a signal. I want you to scoot between my legs. And I'm going to clip you to me. And then I'm going to tap on your shoulder. And you're going to turn to me and give me the okay sign. And then, then we're going to go. So we're there, clips me to him, we scoot to the side by the wing and taps my shoulder and I give him the okay sign. And when I turn to him, that is when I smelled his breath for the very first time. And it smelled like he had had an entire fifth of Jack Daniels that day. And I sat there and I'm, I'm you know, it's too late to turn back and I just think, God, if this is what you have in mind for how I'm going to die, fine. It's better than doing it the way my mom's had to do it. But I will die fearlessly into every moment for the rest of my life. And I yeah. say that all the time. I will die fearlessly into every moment for the rest of my life. And that ability to do that has led me to be able to travel alone in foreign countries that are kind of scary to most people. And to just say, I'm not going to live a life of fear. Now you take that and you do that in your regular life. And that's whether you're talking about what you're doing at work or at home or making decisions for how you're going to live, and just decide you're not going to live a life that's filled with fear. Push it. Live it. Yeah. You only get one shot. Right. I love that. And I, you know, I say if you, if you feel your gut internal, you feel that fear coming in, listen intently, listen closely, and be prepared to step out and get great things to happen. I mean, that's, I'm with you. I, I love what you just said. Did that kind of come about after the book? I mean, did all this kind of happen? What I'm hearing is that it happened after you kind of started um, yeah. hard one with... I, I think that getting out of journalism was the absolute most liberating thing in the world for me. You have to understand, I was not just a boring reporter. I was an investigative reporter. I did some very intense work, and I really was passionate about it. I loved it. I loved journalism. I lived and breathed it. And then I got out of that business and went into a realm where I could really explore growth and self and discover that there was so much more living to be done if you live in a positive light rather than a negative light, that I had so much control over how I lived, how I felt, than I ever knew. And you know, I do a lot of work on performance for people with affirmations because we do have the ability to rewrite the negative script that we have in our head. But few people take the time to do it. And at most, it takes five minutes a day to rewrite the negative that's holding you back. So I went from being a negative person to being the most positive person you're ever going to meet. And it's a much easier and happier way to live. So I highly recommend it to anybody. Yeah, I love that. And I love what you, something is that is the idea of intentionality. I think I'm with you, I think. Um, and I'm fairly new in the, that kind of discovery, too, about the growth and the positivity. And I never realized, um, or when I did realize, have that aha moment, that I've been pretty much living my life on autopilot. And then, and as I take a step back and I've been kind of on this positive growth journey myself, everywhere I look, almost everybody's kind of just on an autopilot. There's no intentionality. And like you said, the five minutes to take how to plan the rest of your life or even your day. Right. So we don't seem to do that. You, you have so much more power than you know. And I, I have friends and they, you know, they are just miserable at work and they have really legitimate gripes. Okay. So I'm not minimizing that. But once you start talking about everything you're griping about again and again and going into that loop, it just brings you further down quicker. And you don't want to go down that path because that's not going to help you. You just make your decision, is this an environment you plan to stay in? And if not, you take action to get out of it. But in the meantime, you don't ruin your life with worry and negativity because you're going to get older. We're not here forever. 
I, I learned so much by my mom's illness. And I, I don't mean to make it sound like it was the most horrible story in the world. She taught me so much about determination and joy because even though she was sick, she found joy in her life. But when she did get sick so young at 66, I learned that time is fleeting, that life yeah. really is fragile, and we have to make a conscious decision about how we're going to spend our life, how we're going to enjoy it. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of awkward sometimes when I'm at a corporate event saying, you know, pull back, take a bigger view at your life, and fill your life with meaning because it's not just about your job and it's not just about your title. It's about the moment and who you are and who you're going to be. So exactly, that word you use, intentionality, I love it. I love it. That's a great trademark for you. Was your mom, I hear you mention her a few times, did, did she have the most dramatic impact on you as a leader? Was, was she kind of your, as you reflect back, was she your most powerful mentor? I had two amazing parents that would, would fit that role. My mom was an amazing businesswoman, just the smartest person I ever met. This is a little bit hard because they both passed away this year over a three-month sure, yeah. three spread, but I'm, I'm going to go there because I learned from my mom that it does not matter what happens that could victimize you. It matters what you do when the bad things come. And she had a stroke when she was 66. And she went from, I'm telling you, this was a great businesswoman. She could have been in Congress if things had been different when she was younger. And it said at 66, she was paralyzed by a stroke. And she just lived a joyous life, even though she was there in that wheelchair. And then she uh, started showing the signs of Alzheimer's. And that was 10 really difficult, difficult years. But through that, I saw love and joy. And my dad, on the other hand, my dad owned a drugstore and he was a pharmacist and his customers loved him. So he was able to build followership with his amazing personality. And he was a good guy. He was a good guy when I was young. And then I got a little older and he got to be a better guy. And then I got a little older. And then by the time that my dad died, he was a man of greatness, of mythical performance. So that at the funeral, they were just talking about what well, the rabbi was, that there are these people that are known as the Lamed Bobniks. And the idea is that there are 26 people on earth at any given time for whom, without them, the entire fabric of humanity would come undone. And um, they, they were talking about these great people. Nobody would know who they are and that the, um, when one dies, another is born. And the rabbi said that after he gave a sermon about that, they were talking in the reception about had they ever met a Lamed Vavnik. And everybody agreed, yes, they had, and it was my father. Because he was so devoted to other people, and especially to my mom, he'd get up early and go to the nursing home and put on her makeup and he'd visit her four times a day and he worked until he was 84 and he was just this great man. Well, you grow into your greatness and he spread so much love and light. So you take the two of them, these, these two forces that were so different and yet together so powerful and I am proud to say I'm their daughter, I'm their legacy. So my goal is to get better every year like he did that hopefully I'm a really good person, now I try, but that by the time I leave this earth, I hope that I can spread as much love and goodness as my dad did, and then also show people a model of strength and determination like my mom did. I love that. Thank you for sharing that with me. That's, just, that's so awesome. And I know what you mean, too, about the, the, the kind of growing into greatness. My father was kind of the same way. A very simple man. And um, I didn't get along with him much, and I did not that it wasn't, you know, the angst or anything like that. I just didn't communicate with, well with him. And then as I moved away, it was kind of like you said, the, 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 he was always good, always knew what he loved, a loving household. But as he progressed through the years, he did, he transformed into this great man. I know exactly what you're talking about. And it was amazing at his funeral, the same thing. And, all, yeah. you know, and he, did, he was a man of great wealth, a man of great, you know, knowledge of, or greatness, which in a stereotypical sense what people would kind of label that but he was great in so many ways in the love and the compassion he had for other human beings and, and the, the amount of people that showed up at his funeral was a testament to how great of a man he really was and uh, so thank you for sharing that with me that, that, that means a lot and um, well, I know how difficult it is to lose your parents so um, and yeah, thank you for sharing that with me well hang on let's go a little bit deeper with that because I do think there's a really good lesson there in what, what you said too because 
there are, are many, 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 many legions of people who buy into this notion that success has something to do with what they have, what their title is, what they do. I mean, you know that when we meet people, we do like to identify them and say, what do you do for a living? But when all is said and done, and when we leave this earth, it does not matter what we did for our work. It mattered right. what we did for each other. And so I really, I like that story about your dad. And I love the story about my dad and my mom. And, you know, it's that who you are is not what you did for your job. You, you know, and that if you're going to define success, define it in a way that matters. So instead of criticizing yourself for what you haven't done, look around you. Are you being good to others? Do people love you? Do you show love? Are you living and experiencing and breathing your life while you're down here? And if so, you are defining a life that matters. I, I've talked now a lot about this notion of mattering. We have to choose to matter. And work certainly matters. But if you look at the things that really, really hit you in your life, it's only one thing on a list. And always know that list of values and things that you care about and see if you're honoring it with your time. Because, yeah. you know, if spirituality is number one, but it's getting 1% of your time, you need to make some adjustments. If family is number one, and it's only getting 30%, you have to decide, is it worth it? I mean, is it worth it? Is what you're doing with your time worth it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, I don't know, I think, what do you think, what do you think is the main reason, why do we tell ourselves and, you know, I certainly go through this with myself, my, my wife, my kids. I see it all the time. Why do we beat ourselves up and say the most horrendous things to ourselves that we would never say to anybody else? Why do you think that is? Oh, um, it's because we've got those bad tapes on our hard drive. But I always tell people, listen, really, feel free to have terrible self-esteem because it guarantees lifelong employment for me. And uh, why it is that we have this negative is that it, you know, tapes re, you know, just keep playing on a loop. And sadly, a lot of what I see is it starts in the morning with something having to do with body image. It might be a bad hair day. It might be your weight. It might be your skin. But then you start with that, and it just kind of perpetuates itself. That's throughout the day, it kind of mushrooms. And, and you're like, wow, do I deserve this job? Ooh, am I smart enough to do this? And, you know, you keep kicking yourself enough, and you can't expect to get the best out of yourself. The good thing is that it's easy to fix it. It's really easy to fix it. I've got this little booklet that I, I pass out at my events because it, it's just a matter of spending five minutes writing the right affirmations and then repeating them. At first, maybe you repeat them a hundred times a day. But if you have five things that you're writing an affirmation about and you do it a hundred times a day, I guarantee you, you can do that in less than five minutes. It's not a big deal. So that in terms of self-esteem, you know, you start with something as might be as simple as, I feel great about myself. I know I'm smart. I'm attractive. You know, they've done studies that if you keep saying to yourself that you're thin and beautiful, and if you're not, you start to lose weight automatically, even if you're dieting or not. So we have a lot more control than we know. Yeah. You guys, you, I'm looking at your books here, and I was, I was uh, doing the press in here last night and looking at them. You know, pearls um, is your latest. What's the difference between uh, pearls and, um, say, personal heart and wisdom? Pearls is a gift book. That's actually that's a good topic for for leadership because it has something to do with a topic I do a lot, which is called viability. With journalists, you watched as newspapers died, right? And all those newspapers thought they knew better, and then newspapers are dying. Well, books are dying too, right? So you've got pearls there, and it's a gift book. And what it's got in it are the best quotes from my first three books. Okay? Great. And it, it, it's got a really fancy silk book ribbon. It's just a bookmark in there. And I go to these events, and people want something signed. So what I do is I sell them that book, and then I've got a little USB drive that they can buy for, I think it's another $40 or, or, you know, I think about 40 bucks more. And it has all my other books on it, 
and it has recordings, audio recordings, and workbooks, and life skills things, and it has the whole Fawn Garmer system in there, right? Now, this is not a commercial for all of that, although if you'd like to buy it, I'm happy to sell it, but no, it's, it's really talking about the notion that we have to constantly redefine ourselves and find a way to make ourselves viable in a world that is changing very quickly. Because I don't want to lose book sales because people are going to go to Amazon and I'll get 50 cents a book. I want to keep them in the room. And this was my strategy. So you always, no matter what career you're doing, think about what it is that you can do to twist and pivot and carry your success with a new technology. Change is something that scares a lot of people, but it's a huge opportunity if you figure it out. Yeah. Well, I just love what you do. I am curious because I, you know, started this. I'm a relatively newbie to this interview game. You know, nine months, ten months into it. What has been? And I'm sure they're probably like your children try to say what your favorite is. But what has been your most maybe favorite or um, maybe unexpected, pleasant unexpected surprise in, in, or interview? Well, I think that there was one that I did with Sylvia Earle, the oceanographer. She, she's just an amazing woman, and it just came at the time when I was making decisions about my life. Because all these people I was interviewing, were they were all volunteering that risk, risk, risk. That's the way to find your greatness. And she said that, and I said, yeah, but have you ever failed? And she said, oh. She described this colossal failure of starting a business when she was in her 60s. She put every dime into it and put her friends in charge of it, and they didn't do a good job with the business, and she lost every dime. And I said, wow, I bet that made you bitter. And she said, no, look what I learned. And this was a huge awakening for me because she was able to rattle off 10 things that she learned through something that everybody else would say was a huge failure. And she said this line, I can always make more money. I got the education. And that was when I started to look at life as you know what you're here to learn in this moment in this experience and I quit my career the next day not just my job I left journalism the next day because of that of course you know I, I thought that I was gonna have this bestseller I'd be out in you know nine months I'd be rich you know Oprah would love me all of those things but I didn't know that you do take risks, but you must, must, must expect the obstacles because it's going to get harder way before it gets easier. And then just when you think it's going to get easy, it's going to get harder. So you have to be ready for things to be very difficult and decide, do you want this or not? And that is really the, the greatest teaching I ever got. So Sylvia Earle, that was a very special interview. And then, you know, I, I've met so many great people and a lot of them were really fun interviews and a lot of them were very interesting and memorable. But, um, you know, to be honest, I speak all over the place. I meet men and women all over the place and it's the normal people that I love the most. It's the people no, who are, yeah, the people who are out there just duking it out every day trying to succeed because I don't see myself as any different from them. I just see myself as really blessed that they will listen to me. And they have inspired me so deeply. Just, it's been an amazing journey. Except, wait, I hate that word, journey. It's been an amazing yeah. adventure. I gotta tell you, I mean, you, I am a huge fan um, of you. I love your authenticity. I love that you're the real deal. I love that you're not, you know, razzmatazz and selling and plugging all this. I mean, yeah, you, you're out there hustling and making a living, but it's, it's genuine, it's authentic, it's a real deal, and I, I'm so glad you came on the show. Well, it's been my privilege, and I, I bet we're going to do some more, because I want to talk to you. You are something else, and I, oh. I'm right behind you. Well, how, where can people find you? I'll, I'll have a link to this on the post when I, when I sure, my, my website. Sure, my website is www.fawngermer.com, and that's F-A-W-N-G-E-R-M-E-R. Fawn Germer. All right, everybody. Uh, Got to check her out. She is the real deal. Check out her books. Check out her website. And uh, again, Fawn, thanks for coming on the show. We'll talk to you again. Thank you so much, Richard.